So when you watch the screencast, a little love. All right. So... So guys, if you had Miss Call last year, you know that Miss Call, even more than me, likes to start her days by looking at the calendar. Like every day, she looks at the calendar, right? You probably, well, if you had me, we calendared some, but not as much. But guys, in AP, we calendar hardly at all. We're about to calendar. So guys, here's why. Today, in just a moment, we are going to start with... I know that that's surprising because if you look at chapter 19, you're like, good stinking night. This is going to take me like a month to figure out. Yes. I'm telling you it won't. So, guys, I have not laid out uh, October yet, but this is the way this is going to go down. Guys, the 16th is the end of the quarter. Um, and we don't, you don't want your first quarter grade to be based only upon that first test. So we are going to get in this, this, this test before the end of the quarter. So guys, this, this is how this is going to happen. And we'll know way more in about an hour. But these are the two scenarios. We have, well, here, let me just show it to you this way. Ready for something weird? So guys, this, this is AP chemistry. There are actually only um, eight units in AP chem. We are right now in thermo, and it goes like this. So guys, we are now done with Hess's Law and calorimetry. We only have two more days of material in this unit. We have a day to talk about entropy, and then we have a day to talk about Gibbs free energy and how that informs uh, conditions at which reactions are spontaneous. So guys, we really have two days of material left. That doesn't, however, mean that our test is going to be on Friday, because typically as we start working through this material, two days turn into three days. Um, it just sort of always tends to happen. So we'll see how today goes. But guys, regardless, I think you can count on the test being on Tuesday the 8th. Then what we will do is I will quick like a bunny get your test graded and we will actually then spend Thursday the 10th. And again, this is all subject to change, but this is the plan right now. We will spend Thursday the 10th. I will give you time in class to rewrite your test. And then any time that you have remaining, you will have to summarize chapter six, which will be our next, our next unit. Um, it's just chapter six and it's a really cool unit. You're going to like it. Um, and then guys, that will then have everything wrapped up prior to the 16th. And we will just uh, call the end of the quarter um, this material, I think we'll probably push chapter, well, we'll see. I'm not sure what we'll do with those chapter six summaries. We may put them on first quarter, we may put them on second, but that's gonna be the end of the quarter. So does that all make sense to you? Guys, one thing you need to keep in mind though, relative to that, is the summer quiz. Um, guys, remember, you gotta get 90% on that bugger. So let me just show you where we're at right now. Um, so guys, this is where we're at. All right, so here's your grades. And guys, there's the summer quiz. Um, so what I've done... But guys, the summer quiz is right here. And what I've done is for all of you that did not hit that 90% benchmark, I replaced your scores with zeros and unexcused them. So your grade in this class right now is based upon you not taking the summer quiz and just blowing it off. Um, guys, don't. 
This is stuff you have to know. Um, so understand, not only, guys, does it help your grade to get this thing. Stuff you have to know. Eventually, you've got to cross this bridge. So you may as well do it in such a way that you get credit for it. Because at the end of first quarter, we're done with the quiz. You're going to have to learn the material eventually. There's just no opportunity for you to be rewarded for it. Um, so guys, again, your grade currently reflects you not passing the summer quiz before the 16th. Um, I would strongly encourage you to do something about that. Um, but right now your grades are reflective of you not getting that done. So, but get it done. So questions on grades, questions on calendar, question, questions. You guys good? Okay. So guys, let me freeze this up so I can get rid of this stuff. Um, guys, open your books to chapter 19. Um, grab your chapter summaries if you want to have them as a reference. Here we go. So guys, the topic of the day, entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. One of you Googled this, didn't you? Admit it. One of you I know. Some who did it? Did you? Have you seen them since? They're dead. Guys, entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. A Googling thing, sort of tongue in cheek, but we do need to say this. You guys are curious, bright people, and you like to think big thoughts. I love some of the videos that we've been watching about cosmology and stuff like that. But guys, the best thing for you to do relative to this idea of entropy is allow your scope, your vision, your field of view, if you will. Guys, you got to get narrow minded on this. We are going to talk about some wacky stuff, like the idea that the sun is actually not just a source of heat, it is a source of disorder. We're going to talk about that. But guys, you're also going to have to let me go, ah, stop, we're done, enough, no more. Because guys, seriously, this whole idea of entropy can be a rabbit hole that we can run down and never get out. So guys, we are going to make this as practical as we can with not beating it to the point where it's not duly interesting. Um, but guys, we're going to do everything that we can to stay focused. So in that spirit, let's talk about focus. And guys, I do not ask this question rhetorically. And interestingly, there is a right answer. So guys, grab your books, grab your notes, your, your outlines, your summaries, whatever you want to call them. And guys, take a minute and page through them. And I know that I've said that there is a right answer, which means you're going to be more reluctant to talk about it because you don't want to get it wrong. But guys, the question that we're going to talk about in just a moment is, what is the most important thing in chapter 19? Before we talk about it, we're going to talk about who gets to decide, because the answer is nobody in this room. <laughs> yes, it's microstates. No, no, no. No, although I did go to a University of Utah symposium once for chemistry teachers, and they actually, the top, one of the topics was how to teach thermochemistry through the lens of microstates. You wouldn't have liked it. It was a mess. It was fascinating, but it was messy. So it's not microstates. So guys, let's first of all say this, and we're really going to talk about this. What is the most important thing in chapter 19? And guys, the answer is, what are you going to be held accountable for in chapter 19? Because guys, remember, we are in process and we're moving towards something bigger. So it's completely valid to ask what's the most interesting thing in chapter 19, but ultimately that doesn't matter. 
because we have a purpose in mind. We want to pass the AP test. So when we ask what is the most important concept in chapter 19, what we're really asking is, what do the AP authors think the most important thing is in chapter 19? So guys, through that lens, what do you think? What do you think the AP authors are going to get you for in chapter 19? So Gibbs Free Energy, Tucker, did I hear you say something? No. Go ahead. Gibbs Free Energy. But guys, Gibbs Free Energy, and somebody said the answer, so I don't want to move past it. But guys, Gibbs Free Energy is actually not an end unto itself. It is a means to an end. And, and the answer is spontaneity. Guys, the, and you may want to write it down. The big idea for chapter 19 is spontaneity. This is what they're going to get you on on the AP test. And guys, it's actually deceptively simple. It's going to take us two concept days, which could turn into three class days to get there. But guys, in the end, you know that you have arrived. If you can answer the question, what does it mean to be spontaneous and under what conditions are reactions spontaneous? So guys, that is the big nugget in chapter 19 is what does it mean to be spontaneous? So guys, here's what we're going to do. To approach this today, we're actually, and don't go there in your books, we're going to go back to chapter 5. And we're going to have a conversation at the tail end of chapter 5 that you didn't even probably catch was there. But guys, chapter 5 ends with them making an interesting statement about endo and exothermic and spontaneity. And we're going to start by picking that up. You don't need to go back and look. We're just going to bring it forward. So guys, we're going to talk about um, what do reactions tend to do when they're spontaneous. Then what we're going to do is we are going to put ourselves in a place of crisis. We're going to talk about some reactions that are spontaneous, and then we're going to talk about a reaction that shouldn't be spontaneous. And we're going to allow that mind-bending crisis to provide motivation for us to talk about what really makes reactions spontaneous. We'll see how far we get. If we get done today, we'll get into the math of this a little bit. I'd be surprised if we do, but that's what we're up to today. You get the idea? Okay. So guys, in order to do this, the first thing we need to do is define what is a spontaneous reaction. So guys, let's just talk about the word spontaneous first, and then we'll apply it to chemistry. So some of you, when you hear the word spontaneous, you think of people that are spontaneous. Hey, we're spontaneous. Spontaneous is not my wife. My wife, Cody's mom, is the opposite of spontaneous. She always needs a plan, which was formed two to seven weeks ahead of time, and then things are going to start happening. My wife is not spontaneous. She's a planner. But guys, if somebody is spontaneous, Cody, am I right? Yeah, I know. So, guys, if somebody is spontaneous, what's true of them? They're just doing, they're going places, doing stuff, running all around. You have no idea where they are or where they're going. But here's the important part, guys. You can see them doing stuff. Stuff is happening, right? That's not a bad place to start. So, guys, what are other things you think of when you think of spontaneous? And it could be in the context of reactions. Right. So you've heard of spontaneous combustion. There used to be like Nova specials on people that are walking down the street and all of a sudden they just burst into flames. Doesn't actually happen. But some things actually can spontaneously burst into flames. It was actually really cool. Um, sorry, Cody, I'm telling family stories. But we used to have this family tradition of going up American Fort Canyon and we would cross country ski through the campgrounds in American Fort Canyon. And one fall they went through and they cut down a bunch of trees and they cut down a bunch of brush and they made this huge pile, like the size of this room, full of all of this brush and, and stuff. And guys, we would be up there in the middle of the winter and that pile of stuff had no snow on it. 
everything around it was buried in snow. There was no snow on that pile. And you'd lean up against it and it'd actually be warm. You know why? It's actually spontaneously, there are reactions going on inside that thing that are wildly exothermic. Do you remember that? Wildly exothermic and giving off heat. And if you were there at the right time of day, you could actually see like steam rising off the pile. So spontaneous things that just happen, happen, happen. What else? Say it again. They're like immediate. They, they, so guys, using all of these as a background, what are then spontaneous reactions? Reactions that just happen. You know, and let's, we're, we're going to say it even that slang. A reaction that happens on its own without any outside intervention. We didn't have to do anything to make that pile simmer. You don't have to do anything to get a spontaneous person to go do stuff. It just happens. So guys, for our working definition, we are going to say that a spontaneous reaction is a process that happens without outside intervention. Go ahead, Caleb. But it, but it, tell me more about this rule, because that's not a rule that I'm familiar with. Well, okay, so maybe it depends on, it depends on how you understand that process, because if you, if you adhere to a strict I mean, forgive me, there's no other term for it. A strictly godless understanding of what happened there, it really did happen spontaneously. It happened on its own. And so there, there are definitely things that, let me give you an example, because there, there actually is not a rule that says every effect has to have a cause. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, think about that. There is not a rule that says every effect has to have a cause. And as a matter of fact, spontaneous things, that's the very point. That, that you don't have to have a cause for there to be an effect. Yeah? But there is a rule that conservation energy energy Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep, okay. 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 And so now what you're talking about is what you're talking about. So guys, Talmadge's thought is, wait, doesn't energy have to go in to break things apart, which then allows energy to come out? So what we're talking about there is activation energy. And when we talk about spontaneity, and Caleb, maybe this is what you were getting to. When we talk about spontaneity, activation energy doesn't count. So, for example, and we're going to use this example in just a minute, to get Bunsen burner gas to light, and this is shut off, but if we turn this on, you understand that this Bunsen burner gas is not going to spontaneously burst into flames. And you probably understand the reason is because we've got to be able to break apart the methanes and break apart the oxygen molecules. And once that's happened, they're ready to go. Here's the trick, though. That does not make this not spontaneous. Um, adding that, at Caleb, adding that initial push with the striker to get this burning um, does not negate the fact that once we do that, we don't have to do anything to keep it going. So when we talk about spontaneous, we say something that occurs on its own with outside intervention, and we don't count the initial push that may be needed to get it started. With that said, and Caleb, this could be to your point too, there doesn't always need to be an initial push. There are reactions that don't need the initial push, and we're going to look at some of those as well. Okay, you guys okay with us right now? So let's get practical and let's talk about examples. So guys, examples of, of, of these reactions. So let's talk about, first of all, this big idea that, that Talmadge got us thinking about. So guys, what is it then that makes, and this was the little nugget at the end of chapter five. So I'm just gonna give it to you. And then if this is concerning, we can talk. But guys, chapter five actually ends with this interesting idea that in order for a reaction to be spontaneous, it has to be an energy loser. Just write it down and then we'll talk if we need to. 
But guys, chapter 5 ended, and again, I didn't expect you to pick this up. Chapter 5 ended with the idea that if a process is spontaneous, it is an energy-losing process. And again, coming to Talmadge's idea, if we're talking about Bunsen burner gas burning, we know that we have to give it that initial input of energy with the striker to get some of the methane and some of the oxygen to dissociate. And that is an energy taker in her. But then those reorganization and forming of new bonds releases enough energy to break apart other molecules and then it becomes self-sustaining. So guys, we need to agree on this common idea. And this, isn't, this, is, this is truth. All, all, and all, all processes that are spontaneous are energy losers. We're not counting the initial input of energy if necessary, but all are energy losers. Are we okay? Go ahead. Say it again. That's tell me, So let me say that to everybody so everyone can hear it. Um, and then you're going to find out what you're talking about is something we're going to dig into maybe today, but maybe next time. So Cody's question is, does the, does the formation of ice count as spontaneous, right? Was that your, okay. So tell me what you're thinking. Exactly. And what are those particular conditions? Temperature below freezing, right? And what you're going to, so guys, Cody's question is really good. And it's actually how we're going to end chapter 19. What you're going to find is that all reactions, and forming ice is not a reaction, it's a physical change. But guys, all processes have conditions at which they are spontaneous and conditions at which they're no longer spontaneous. And guys, that's actually going to be the math of chapter 19. And the thing that AP offers authors love is questions like, at what temperature range is this process spontaneous? And so for the formation of ice, it would be below zero Celsius. And so if you think about it, the idea then is this, if you've got a cup of water and so our surroundings would be the air, and if the air is below zero Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit, then this water can lose energy to the surroundings and it spontaneously freezes. So still in keeping with this, it's losing energy to the surroundings and it's creating ice spontaneously. So what if this temperature is above zero degrees Celsius? Well, now this cannot lose enough energy to the surroundings in order to form ice and then it is not spontaneous above zero Celsius. And that's the question that we're going to be really getting into at the end of this unit, guys, is temperature conditions at which things are spontaneous. Bailey, go ahead. Now, and that, okay, so now we can talk about this. So what about then the, um, yeah, good question. So what about then if we have a block of ice and this is at, I don't know, 50 Celsius, so it's warm, right? So now the idea is this, will this ice melt on its own? And the answer is no, the room actually has to give energy to that. So ice doesn't melt on its own. Ice only melts when there's something around to give it heat. Do you see the difference? And so, but guys, Bailey's question is really insightful because these are the mental games that we're going to have to play in order to figure out what spontaneous means. So the idea is, let's, let's do this again. So say you've got a cup of water and it's, it's, in, it's, in a, it's in a space where there's nothing else. It's in a vacuum. That cup of water can dump energy into space and spontaneously freeze. Nobody has to be there to get it to freeze, but ice does not spontaneously melt. There has to be something there to give it energy to make it melt. And so that would be the difference. And guys, it is. It's a ton of semantics and a ton of this thinking, which is what makes this interesting. Yeah. Yeah. 
Right, because, because so you're saying, but realize something has to carry that temperature. So if it is in fact a vacuum, there's nothing there to have a temperature and therefore there would be nothing to give it energy, excluding radiation, which is a whole nother conversation. You guys good? All right, so guys, let me, and again, remember what I said, we could play mind games with this forever, but do you remember the, the sort of the blanket statement I made at first? We need, and I, I'm happy to do questions, but eventually we've got to come to the stuff we need to know. So guys, with that said, let me give you some increasingly complex examples. I'd write them down. So guys, an example of this is a ball rolling downhill. So here's a hill and here's a ball. See, hill and ball. Yeah. So guys, if we have a ball sitting on a hill, what's it gonna do? Roll. roll. And clearly we know that it's not gonna roll this way, it's gonna roll that way. So guys, why do balls roll down and not up? No, 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 no. It's not about gravity. We're talking about energy now, y'all. And we can relate that to gravity in a minute. But guys, you got to understand this. Why do balls roll downhill? They are losing energy. Yes, that energy is potential energy, which is a function of gravity and position. But guys, fundamentally, balls roll downhill because they're losing energy. You sold on that idea? So guys, what about this? When the ball gets to the bottom, does it ever roll uphill? No. Balls do not roll uphill. Balls roll downhill because, just like Robbie, when they roll downhill, they lose energy. Now guys, this is important. Does that mean balls can never go uphill? No. no, but in order for a ball to go, guys, this is not, this is not trivial, hear this. In order for a ball to go uphill, what do we have to do to get it to go uphill? No, 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 but use a physics term, use a science word. We gotta do work. So guys, this is the idea. So let me, let me reset the tables because this is a very important concept. So guys, we've got a ball here and that ball rolls downhill and it loses energy. So when the ball gets to the bottom of the hill, it will never go back up on its own. This is important. On its own, this ball will never go back uphill. Now, can we make it go uphill? Yes, but we have to do work on it. So guys, here's the question. Which of those two processes is spontaneous? Down or up? down. So, but guys understand that just because down is spontaneous doesn't mean up can't happen. It just, and this is the important idea. It can happen. It just has to go through a different pathway. So the idea is this, just like an else. When the ball goes down, it happens on its alone and it's losing energy. Can we put it back? Yeah, by putting the energy back into it, but that only happens by doing work on it. The ball rolls down spontaneously, the ball can be reset, but that involves doing work on the ball that wasn't done for the ball to roll down. Alice, go ahead. Oh my, that is exactly correct. We're not there. Guys, if you heard what Alice said, the answer is yes. This is why I have you do chapter outlines. What you said is exactly right, but I don't want to get into reversibility. No, 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 but you're exactly right. And that's cool you understand that. It's actually on the next slide and we're going to invite reversibility in this, but let's not include it in our conversation yet. Yeah. Robbie, let's not go there now because we're not universally there. Um, in chapter six, we will be, and we're going to bring a lot of this into chapter six. Um, maybe I don't. I didn't. I, I didn't get the chance purposefully. I didn't let you ask your whole question. This is this is hard enough without electrons. <laughs> uh, we'll talk in chapter six. So, guys, are you all settled on this idea of balls rolling downhill all by themselves? Now, let's look at a chemical reaction hydrocarbons burning, which is what Talmadge got us thinking about. 
Now, guys, this brings up that interesting bit. Do methanes, we can write down the reaction if you want. So Bunsen burner gas, CH4, plus O2, carbon dioxide, and water. Does that happen all by itself? And this is where we get into a little bit of a problem because guys, if I had this Bunsen burner tap open and it was spilling methane into the room, you know that it wouldn't just burst into flames. So guys, when we talk about spontaneous, what we're talking about is do you need to keep adding energy? So the idea is that once we strike this and it lights, we don't have to keep doing the striker. So when we talk about loss of energy and spontaneity, that initial input of energy that may be necessary does not discount the idea. Go ahead. Sure. No, and that's this. I that's a fascinating question. I, I'm going to use your words. So, guys, the said, is that a different category of spontaneity? And it gets even worse because later on, when we start talking about things in the next couple days, guys, some of you are going to start thinking about more spontaneous and less spontaneous. There, and so I'm catching this now, guys, please hear this. There is no such thing as categories of spontaneity. Either it is or it isn't. So there, there, there's no more, there's no less, there's no different type of spontaneity. Spontaneity is, is a descriptor. It is a reality for a reaction, and either it is or it isn't. Again, as Cody pointed out, it is dependent upon environment and specifically temperature if we think about ice melting and water freezing. But what we will say is at these conditions, is it spontaneous? So if it's in a hot room, spontaneous. Still happens in a cold room, still spontaneous. So we always indicate temperature and then determine spontaneity. And either it is or it isn't. Yeah. Did I say that? But, but, but that does not mean that all reactions do. There are some reactions that are always spontaneous no matter what we do to them. You can't, you can't make them not happen. You know what I mean? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's actually, this is the very last thing we're going to do in this unit is talk about these ranges of spontaneity. Okay. So guys, let's do this. Go ahead. Sorry. No? No. So don't, don't confuse spontaneity with reactions that go to completion. So the Bunsen burner tap, yeah, so sure. So it wouldn't even fit into the conversation because what you're talking about is you're talking about the absence of a reactant. And if the reactant's gone, we can't talk about the reaction. So guys, let me bring you then to this idea. Burning methane, endo or exothermic? Exothermic, so it loses energy and the reaction happens spontaneously. We good? One more. Guys, what about the rusting of a nail? Is this spontaneous? Is a nail rusting spontaneous? Do you have to do anything to a nail to get it to rust? If you want a nail to rust, all you got to do is get a nail. And it's going to rust. You're like, wait, I have nails that don't rust. It's because they have coatings. But guys, if you have an iron nail, you ain't got to do nothing. You put that nail on your table and you come back in a year and that bugger's going to be rusty. You don't have to talk to it. You don't have to blow on it. You don't have to heat it up. That thing is going to rust, right? Now, guys, did you know that rusting nails are actually exothermic? Did you guys know that? Yeah, let's talk about this because, guys, ski season's coming. So, 
You guys know the little, the little heat packs, right? You buy them like a dollar a piece at Walmart. And guys, as soon as you open up the package of the heat pack, that thing gets hot. Do you know what's inside one of those heat packs? All it is is ground up nails and a little bit of a catalyst, which we'll talk about later. But guys, the heat that is given off by one of those heat packs is actually just the exothermic rusting of iron. It's exactly the same reaction that happens when a nail rusts. The only difference is, is they grind up that iron into such a fine powder that there's so much surface area that the reaction happens a lot faster. But it's exactly the same reaction that happens when nails rust. It's exothermic. It's just a lot slower with the nail because there's not as much surface area. So guys, let's see if this fits our thinking. So when nails rust, does that give off energy? Yeah, absolutely. If we grind up the nail, we can actually feel that energy being given off. But guys, even if it's just a nail rusting, we have to understand it's still giving off energy just so slowly that we can't detect the change in temperature. So is that endo or exothermic? Nails rusting. Exothermic, that's giving off heat. That makes it spontaneous. Do you get the idea? You okay? Go ahead. So in order for the reaction to be spontaneous, it has to be exothermic. Keep going. But if it's exothermic, it doesn't necessarily mean it's spontaneous. And I'm sure we'll get to that when we add more characteristics. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you talk yourself into that corner. Okay. So Robbie said something that I'm not going to contradict yet. So, and I'm just going to take, and I know your whole thought is the complete thought, but I want to dwell on your first thought. So guys, Robbie said this. has to be exothermic, which guys ties in to this idea that these reactions lose energy, losing energy in the form of heat is exothermic, right? And so all of these examples, well, a ball rolling downhill, well, actually that does give off heat as well. Friction with the air, it actually does warm up the air a little bit. So guys, all of these processes are giving off energy. They're exothermic. They're releasing energy many times in the form of heat, and they are all spontaneous. You guys all settled with that? So guys, this is, and this, this is not vague, this isn't always. All processes that are spontaneous lose energy. Are you sold on the idea? I'm gonna keep going. Are you sold? You're good? Do you have a question about that? Because I don't want to do any more what ifs. No, I was just gonna say can't lose energy. Um, not in this class. So it could, but we are not going to talk about work right now. Yeah, no, we're we're going to focus on heat. Go ahead, Jason. Um, with the ball rolling down the hill, yeah. I think, is it, if it's just losing potential energy, it's really yeah. uh, also mean it's gaining kinetic energy? So it, it's convert, it's con, yeah, so through friction. So the idea is that it's losing energy through the form of, you know, eventually the ball's going to stop, right? So it's, lose, it's converting potential to kinetic, but it's losing energy as well. So the thing that we want to picture is just see that ball losing energy. It's a little more complicated because you've got the inner conversion of energy. But we, we, if you're okay picturing energy leaving as the ball rolls downhill, we're okay. You guys okay? Okay. So guys, I've got one more for you. So reactions lose energy, and that makes them spontaneous. Because I want to show you another one. You guys ever fiddle around with these? These are quick cold packs. Um, you crush this, and I don't know if you know how they work, but guys, there's an inner bladder inside this outer bladder. And if you listen, you can hear that there are crystals in here, little pellets. Um, those pellets are actually pellets of ammonium nitrate. And then guys, inside this, there is actually a inner bladder that's just a bladder of water. And when you crush this, what's happening is the ammonium nitrate goes into solution and it makes ammonium ions and nitrate ions. But guys, why do we use these in the first place? Because they get cold, right? 
So guys, if we crush this and it gets cold, what direction is the energy flowing in or out? And if the energy is flowing in, we now have a problem. Because guys, do we have to do anything to this to make it get cold other than get the water together with the ammonium nitrate? No, so is it spontaneous? All I gotta do, <laughs> Good night. Maybe. I can't get it to break. Well, all right. It won't break. Don't be scared. It seriously won't break. This thing is so old. Uh, all right, I give up. So, guys, all I got to do is pop the bladder, right? And that's it. All I've got to do is get these two things together, and this thing gets cold all on its own. So is it spontaneous? Are you convinced of that? But is energy going in or out? Energy's going in. So guys, we've got a little crisis on our hands because things like quick cold packs are examples of processes that are actually endothermic but still spontaneous. Just a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead for a minute. Actually, I'm going to leave that up, though. So, guys, we've got a problem. And I want to lead you to this problem. Because the problem is not what you think. So, guys, here's the problem. We said earlier and emphatically that in order for a process to be spontaneous, it has to give off energy. And we looked at a bunch of examples of processes which do, in fact, give off energy. Then, guys, once we establish that foundational idea, we now have an exception to the rule. And there are many, but this is the most visual that I could come up with. Guys, we have an exception to the rule. So our rule is, in order for something to be exothermic, it has to give off, or I'm sorry, in order for something to be spontaneous, it has to give off energy. Now we have an example of a process that is spontaneous. Are we sold on that? It is spontaneous, but it's not giving off energy. It's taking in energy. So guys, the question is this. Does this example mean that this is not true? Let me state this again. Do you understand the tension? So we've established a theory that says for things to be spontaneous, they have to lose energy. And now we have an example of a system that is spontaneous, but now it's gaining energy. Does that mean that the previous rule, just a second, Caleb, does that mean that the previous rule is not true? And guys, I'm, I want to talk, but I, wanna, I don't want this to get muddled, so I'm just going to answer my own question. So do you understand the question? We know that these things have got to lose energy to be spontaneous. Now we have an example of something that's not, not losing energy. Does that mean that the rule's not true? And guys, interestingly, the answer is this. That thing is still losing energy. This system is losing energy. Even though it's still cold, it's still losing energy. Does that seem weird? So guys, here's the idea. Here's what we're saying now. We've got our quick cold pack. I don't know why this won't break. We've got our quick cold pack, and now it, we've got a system, that, a process that is spontaneous, but this feels cold. So energy is going this way, right? But now here's what we're saying. The reason that this is spontaneous is because it turns out that energy is actually going out. But guys, the reason that we're confused is because our understanding of energy is too narrow. What kind of energy is going into this? Heat. But guys, here's the answer. All the while that heat is going into this, there's another kind of energy that's going out. And even more of this energy is going out than heat is going in. You guys, what kind of energy is that? Disorder. Let's say this again. 
Guys, we had to pause for dramatic effect, but guys, let's say this again. Ready? Questions. Be ready with answers. Is this spontaneous? Yes. yes. Does that mean that it's losing energy? Yes, this is true. This thing is losing energy. But guys, the problem is, is that our understanding of energy up until now has been too narrow. Because when we think of energy exchange, getting rid of work, and I'm so glad you said that, Talmadge, getting rid of work up until now, we thought the only way to gain or lose energy was heat. But guys, there's another way that this can lose energy. And it's through, are you looking for the test key? Yeah, it's right there. Guys, the other way that this thing can lose energy is through disorder. And that's why this thing is spontaneous. While yes, it is taking in energy in the form of heat, it is losing energy in the form of disorder. And I'm gonna tell you this right now, the amount of energy that this loses to disorder is greater than the amount of energy that it absorbs as heat. And how do I know that's true? Let me say it again, Google. Let's say this again. Ready? Listen, guys. This is important you understand this. The amount of energy that this system is losing as disorder is greater than the amount of energy that it's gaining as heat. And how do I know that's true? Because it's spontaneous. <laughs> guys, this is true. We are not changing this rule. Guys, in order for something to be spontaneous, it has to lose energy. It's just we now know, or we're starting to talk about the idea, that the only way to lose energy is not just heat. It can also be disorder. And so, guys, what's going on here is that while, yes, this thing is gaining energy in the form of heat, it is losing energy in the form of disorder. And the amount of energy that it's losing as disorder is greater than the amount of energy that it's gaining as heat. And that is what makes it spontaneous. Go ahead, Eddie. No? Are you sold? Go ahead. You sure? Okay, so guys, let, let's summarize because I know your minds are duly blown. And it goes like this. Guys, if energy must be lost to the surroundings in order for a reaction to be spontaneous, how can we explain the quick cold pack? And guys, the answer is simply this. Our definition of energy exchange is too narrow. It's not just heat. It's also disorder. And guys, you got to wrap your head around this. Disorder is a driving force in the universe. Some of you are well aware of this because no matter how hard you try, you can't keep your bedroom clean. It's not your fault. It's spontaneous. Actually, it is. It's spontaneous. Guys, it takes work to organize your bedroom, but it gets messed up all on its own. See? It's all entropy. You can just tell your parents, Mom, Dad, it's not me. It's just physics. It's just entropy. So, guys, now what we've done, and I know this is weird, and we're just touching on it, and I don't expect you to have a deep understanding of this. This happens on its own. And all spontaneous processes lose energy. But now we've got to open our horizons and we've got to understand that energy loss does not just happen by losing heat. It can also happen by creating disorder. And that's why the quick cold pack works because that quick cold pack is increasing disorder. Go ahead. So no, and so understand cold is, is a human experience. There's no such thing as cold. Um, so when we experience something that feels cold, what we're experiencing is heat being sucked out of us. So when we think of cold, what we're really experiencing is, is heat flowing away. And so in this case, the heat is flowing into this. But that means that the surroundings are giving heat to the system and that shouldn't be spontaneous. Um, that's like pushing a ball uphill. But we know that that's not the case. And the reason that that is allowed is because 
as heat enters that system, it creates an increase in disorder. Go ahead. Uh, so what is disorder? Good. So do you want to talk about microstates? <laughs> no, no, no. So Alice, actually, we are going to define disorder, but <laughs> not, not today we're not, um, but we are going to define disorder and we will talk about microstates a little bit, but we will define disorder. Go ahead. The, the the ammonium nitrates in the water. Okay, so the heat is going into the system, mm -hmm. but disorder is not leaving the system, or is it no? The system, system is becoming more disordered. But and this is but your question is really good, and I I want to touch on it quickly, and then we're going to move forward just for a moment. But I the the problem that you are having is you're, you're, and I love the way you're conceptualizing this. So you're like, wait, is is disorder going in or out? And actually. Asking that question is inappropriate because it begs the idea that there's like a law of conservation of disorder and there isn't. Disorder lost is not equal to disorder gain. Disorder is always going up um, and we're going to talk about that. What's turning now into Wednesday. We're going to talk about that. But in any, in any spontaneous process, disorder is always going up. Um, the disorder of the, in this particular example, we'd have to look into it more deeply. Yeah, but we're going to talk about that exchange of disorder next time. So guys, what I'd like to do then to wrap up today um, is I would like to, to continue the conversation on, on Wednesday, guys. There are some terms. are going to do this. If you want to print the notes and just listen, that's fine. But guys, for us to move forward in this conversation next time, we've got to define these terms. So first of all, reverse. You know what, guys? Do this. Don't try to write any of this down. Print the notes. We don't have time, but we've got to do this. So guys, we have things that are called reversible processes. A reversible process is a process in which it is possible, and guys, don't pack up. It is a process in which it is possible to go um, <clears throat> back to an original state with no net change in the system or the surroundings. Guys, an example of this that I really like is a cup of ice water at zero degrees Celsius. If you have ice water at zero degrees Celsius, is it freezing or melting? Yes. It's doing both because guys, what happens is this, and this is important, guys, which has more energy, the ice or the liquid water? The liquid water has slightly more energy. So this is a liquid water molecule and the liquid water molecule crashes into the surface of the ice and it gives up that energy and it into the ice and a water molecule leaves the ice and goes into the liquid state. And there's no net change. Water is freezing and melting at the same time um, at zero degrees Celsius. And guys, this is what is called a reversible reaction. Please understand reversible does not mean that nothing's happening. It means that both are happening simultaneously and the energy lost is equal to the energy gained. Just a second. There's a name for this that you're more familiar with. Equilibrium. Guys, by definition, reversible processes are at equilibrium. Leah, I'm going to keep going so we can get. Yep. That's called equilibrium. Okay, now guys, we have what are called irreversible processes. Guys, an irreversible process is a process which cannot simply be undone by reversing the events that caused it. And again, guys, I'm not going to give you time to do this. Guys, understand this though. It can go backwards. It just happens through a different path. And then, guys, finally, this last idea, if you're trying to write these down, print the notes. Guys, spontaneous processes. 
We've already talked, right? They happen on their own. But guys, spontaneous processes always have a direction in which they occur and they are irreversible. So let me offer you this to bring these ideas together. Ready? Dun, dun, dun. Here we go. So guys, we have some eggs being held above a counter. So if we let go of these eggs, what are they going to do? They're going to fall. Do we have to do anything to make them fall? No, they are going to fall and they are going to go splat. Huh? Do you agree that that is spontaneous? agree that that is spontaneous. Does that make it reversible or irreversible? Irreversible. But guys, you got to understand this. This is spontaneous and therefore irreversible. But does that mean it can't be undone? No. In theory, we could take this mess and put back into eggs. We could put them back together. We could glue them. We could make it perfectly back together. And then we could put them back up in the hand. But that would take a lot of work. And I mean work. And as a result, guys, because the breaking and the reforming doesn't happen through the same pathway, it is irreversible and therefore spontaneous. So guys, here's what you need to do. Look over these problems that you can. It is posted in the notes. But to be honest with you guys, we're not going to grade these on Wednesday. We're going to just pick up from here. And then, guys, as you are going, Tucker, Jonah, Daniel, Emma, uh, Alice, and Addie, you guys have little notes here. So, guys, we'll see you on Wednesday. Here we go.